Thank you. The theme of your convention is by my spirit. We live in a world where everything is influenced by, controlled by, and affected by spirit. Either the spirit of God or the spirit of darkness. So that the things that are seen are influenced by the things that are not seen. So that there is a power at work in the lives of the child of God and there is a power at work in the lives of those who are not children of God and the effect of that power at work is seen in the in the evidence that's produced in their lives so that those who are filled with God's spirit controlled by the Holy Spirit, will exhibit the works of the Spirit. Those who are controlled by and influenced by the powers of darkness will obviously, as Paul says to the Galatians, exhibit the works of the flesh. And I don't think we have to look very far to see the works of the Spirit of God or to see the works of the flesh. We see that all around us. I do not know what was in the mind of those who chose the theme. But the statement by my spirit has a very special connection to the restoration of Israel after their 70 years of dispersion. And Jeremiah had prophesied that they will be dispersed for 70 years. Then God will restore them. Their restoration had a very clear connection with the preparation for the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. For even though they were scattered, they were still God's people. But Christ was prophesied to be born in a particular place, under particular circumstances. So they had to be restored. That restoration involved three men. Nehemiah, Ezra, and Zerubbabel. Nehemiah was the master builder. He would be the one to lead the construction of the walls and the temple and to restore some life unto a city that was left in ruins for 70 years. Ezra was the scribe. And among the ruins, they were able to find the scrolls that represented the Torah and other writings of the prophets and works of the law. And so Ezra's role was to reintroduce to the people the laws of God. They were in dispersion for 70 years. Zerubbabel was the only member of the royal family of the lineage of David that was left. All the others had disappeared for one reason or the other, but Zerubbabel was the only survivor. It is important to note that the Lord Jesus Christ, through his earthly parents, must come from the lineage of David. You see, once God says something, it cannot change. God is immutable. He is unchanging. And so Zerubbabel, you would see his name mentioned in the genealogy of Joseph and Mary 
in the book of Matthew and also in the book of Luke. Zerubbabel, being the only member of the royal family, faced resistance from the counselors and advisors to the king of Medo-Persia. Because to send back a royal prince was to indicate to the people that they were now self-governing. They now had their own monarchy when Israel was still under foreign domination. Zerubbabel had to struggle to get back. It was, it was not a problem for Nehemiah. His problem started after he got there. It was not a problem for Ezra. He had difficulties after he got there. But for Zerubbabel, his problem was getting there. And it was out of this struggle that the scripture and the statement was born. Who are you mounting to stand before me, O Zerubbabel? For it is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, so that whatever the hindrance, the impediments, whatever the things that stumbling blocks that were put in the way, there was a solution. And the solution was not in military might because Israel had no army. The solution was not in economic power because they had no economy. The solution was not in political diplomacy because they had no government. And when you have nothing with which to fight, When you look around and everything you have amounts to one big zero, then there's only one place to look and that's up. I would lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. For my help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. And so it is in that context that the statement was made by my spirit. What God was saying to Zerubbabel because he may have been trying diplomacy. He may have been trying other means of engaging the attention of the king in order to have a favor granted. But I need for you to understand when there are no favors from anyone around, I like the word of the psalmist. He makes a very clear statement. He said to Zion, he said, your appointed time, your set time has come for the Lord would look with favor upon you. The word favor comes from the same root as the word grace and the word bless. And so the word favor implies to be granted a special dispensation. The word grace is to be granted something you don't deserve. And the word blessing is to be granted a position that you could not acquire on your own. And so, God would look with favor when the appointed time is come. Having said all of this, I want you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. I would read a short portion, but would make reference to other areas of Genesis, chapter 1. By my spirit. Now I want you to keep those words in your mind. I will read from verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth, and I want you to note clearly, 
descript this description in verse 2. And the earth was without form. And the earth was void or empty. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. Let me read those words again. And the earth was without form. It had no shape or structure or system or order. And the earth was void as a result of the lack of any structure or system or order. Then there was emptiness. The earth was empty, barren, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So all of this constituted to an uninhabitable, barren, desolate, dark, and dismal environment. Now having said that, what does the writer in the book of Genesis say next? And that is the pivotal point that I want you to note. And the Spirit of God moved. We will pick up the rest of the statement. And the Spirit of God moved. In the midst of barrenness, emptiness, disorder, in the midst darkness and dismay in the midst of nothing. The Spirit of God moved. The first act of God was that His Spirit, and in other versions it will say His Spirit hovered over the darkness, the emptiness, the void, the barrenness, the Spirit of God hovered over like a cloud just above there, just hovering over that empty, barren environment waiting for the next move of God. You see, God is very structured in the way He operates. It is not any old way. He has a process. He has a system. He has an order. His order may not always work with our system. So we have to adjust our system to work with His. For example, when Gabriel the angel appeared to Mary, said, Mary, you are highly favored among women. The Lord is with you. You are blessed. Then he moved on. You're going to have a baby. A son. Now the first statement she could accept, Pastor Gomes. Highly favored, blessed, all of that. That's great. But the second statement. You're going to have a son. Threw her off that spiritual height that she just climbed up on. That's impossible. Because under my system, under my order, under the way we look at things, it can't be done. Are you understanding? The way we plan and organize things, Mary is saying, that's impossible. And that's why there are times we may not get some things done because the way we organize it may not be the way God wants it done. I'm not saying our order is wrong. I'm not saying we are doing the wrong thing. I'm saying God may have a different way of doing it. You see, Mary's plan was to get married to Joseph. That's her plan. 
her plan was as soon as Joseph is finished building the house in Nazareth, set up his carpentry business, they were already espoused to each other. He's going to come one day and say to her parents, I'm ready. And Mary will go over to his house and the marriage will be complete and somewhere down the road, Mary is going to have a son. That's her way. That's her plan. There's nothing wrong with it. But God has another plan. And God's plan could upset your plan. And Mary said, Seeing I am a virgin, Seeing I've never been with a man. Seeing those things as they are, how shall this be? How is this going to happen? You know, sometimes we hit some difficult spots in ministry, in church. Sometimes we do everything we know how to do and it's just not doing. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, you speak in tongues all night. And you fast all day. And you preach all Sunday. And you wake up Monday and you're ready to say like Jeremiah, I'm going in the wilderness and build an inn and take care of weary travelers. But somehow you make it back next Sunday. Because you can't get away from the call of God. You see, it isn't that what we're doing is wrong. But sometimes it may not be lining up. There's a term I, I was being, I've been using last year quite a bit. Alignment for assignment. Not, not assignment and then you align. You have to align first. Then the assignment is going to come. If you have the assignment first, you will come up with your own way of doing it. But if you have the alignment first, so she asked, how is this going to be? And Gabriel didn't get into some long theological debate. He didn't say, well, you know, uh, the, the executive board has got to sit and see how we could work this thing out. No. The executive board had already sat. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. They knew exactly. We need organizational structures. That's important. Man is a very lawless creature. Even after he is saved, he needs some help to organize things. So we need that. We, we need the systems in place. All of that. But over and above all is that executive board. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And, and Gabriel says, it's very simple, Mary. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is going to come upon you. And once the Spirit of God takes over your body, that what God's going to do is overrule the laws of nature. And you won't need a man to get pregnant. Because God will create a fetus in heaven. And the Holy Spirit will put it in your uterus. The Holy Spirit is going to do that. Mary did not argue. She did not debate. She said, let it be done unto me according to your word. Nine months later, the Savior of the world was born. Now, now, in the midst of the darkness, the Spirit of God moved. I need for us to understand something tonight. Bishop, I've been to many churches where I see people trying to move the Spirit. They try to get the music going to move the spirit. 
I've seen preachers slap down people to move the spirit. Poke them in the belly to move the spirit. Spit in their face to move the spirit. I I'm sure you've seen those kinds of things. Huh? I'm sure you've seen that. Listen. You don't need to fall down to have the spirit. But if you do, that's fine. You don't need to shake to have the spirit. But if you like shaking, go ahead. You don't need to fraught at the mouth to have the spirit. But if that makes you feel good, go ahead and fraught. You see, when the spirit came upon Mary, you see, when, when we react those ways, and listen, I've been Pentecostal from day one. And I've seen things, and I've seen things, I, I, I've seen things. Okay? When the Spirit of God came upon Mary. And this is one of the greatest acts of the manifestation of God. Where God the Son is going to be lodged in a fetus in a woman's womb. Mary didn't fall down. She didn't hop around on one foot. She didn't shake like a leaf in the wind. She didn't drift around and knock down some chairs. Now, I know we like to do that. And uh, it's very Pentecostal to do that. The night I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I knew when I got hit. And I knew when I got up about five hours later. I thought that's what you have to do. I rolled. I broke off a chair leg. You know, I, I damaged a shirt. I, I did all kinds of things. I had fun. No, we, that's fine. We're talking here about the moving of the Spirit. Not you and I moving the Spirit, but the Spirit moving. And sometimes, like a rushing mighty wind. Sometimes, like a flame of fire. And sometimes, like a gentle dove. But it moves. And when the spirit moves, something happens. When the spirit moves, we stand still. Because he is in control. Are you understanding me? And, and, and so, about a hundred, little more than a hundred years ago, I think uh, maybe four years ago it was in the U.S. when they celebrated the hundredth anniversary of Azusa Street, and, and then last year, 2010, the Pentecostal Assemblies of the West Indies uh, celebrated 100 years of the the existence which started with a mighty revival on the island of Montserrat up in the northern Caribbean uh, or well eastern Caribbean but up north uh, these are the result of a, of a move of God not a move of man uh, about four or five years ago the same year that they celebrated the 106th anniversary or the 100th anniversary of um, Azusa I was in Cincinnati, Ohio I was asked to preach in a church only when I got to the church now this is a church that had closed down for 25 years it, it had pews it had musical instruments beautiful building maybe a little bigger than this lovely facility but closed down for 25 years and I know somebody took it over and was going to revive the thing. And I was asked to come for the resurrection service. And so I got there. Said before I got there, let me find out a bit of the history of this church. And I found out that 
the man who came out of this church was the man who is highlighted in the Azusa Street Missions, Seymour. This was the church he came out of. This was where the fire was lit. This was where the spark started. It was in this altar he knelt and wept and prayed. He had one eye. I found out it was while praying here that one somebody dealt some stones into the building because he was praying so loud and knocked one of his eyes out. But it did not stop him. Seymour continued to seek the face of God, journeyed from Cincinnati, Ohio to California, and was a part of that great move of God that touched Azusa Street, the Appalachian Mountains, that went straight across the U.S. into London, into Durban, South Africa, into Kerala, India, into Montserrat in the Caribbean, a worldwide move of the power of God. It was the Spirit of God that moved. It wasn't man. And we have come full circle. We have come full circle. Because after a hundred years, ladies and gentlemen, we are no more the little group by the side of the road. We are no more the storefront churches. We are no more the unrecognized preachers. In fact, the Pentecostal movement the full gospel movement commands more time on radio and television and the internet more than any other religious group in the world. We have grown. I'm told from the statistics that a hundred years ago there were about five million people around the world that were considered to be spirit-filled people. Today, that figure, if we only look at those who come under the umbrella of Pentecostal, is over 900 million in a hundred years. Pope Paul, Pope John the Twenty-Third, on a visit to Brazil in the 60s, was amazed at the move of God and how people were turning to God away from the Roman Catholic Church. And he made mention of this move. He says, we have Catholicism and we have the Protestant movement, but this is a third force for which they had no name. But it has continued because the Spirit of God moved. Here we have come to the 21st century. We have grown. Lagos, Nigeria, the largest church building in the world. In one sitting, 50,000 in their sanctuary. An overflow field that could hold 250,000. Every Sunday, there's about 300,000 people in and out of that place worshiping God. In Seoul, South Korea, Central Full Gospel Assembly, Dr. Paul young Cho, over one million people in that congregation. I stood from my hotel window and looked down at the street across from the church one Sunday morning and the police of Seoul was in full force. They had shut down uh, the certain areas from no traffic only to allow buses in to bring tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands that will come. I, I, they announced a prayer meeting, Bishop, uh, the Sunday I was there. And I went on Monday to the office. I was going to leave on the Tuesday. And I went on Monday to the office, which is, a, I think, a 15-floor building. And, uh, and I spoke to one of the pastors there who was able to speak English. And I asked him, I said, what was the prayer meeting like yesterday? 
He said, well, we were a little short on attendance yesterday because it was short notice. I said, what do you mean by short on attendance? He says, well, we estimate we probably had about 100,000 people out to the prayer meeting. The Spirit of God moved. Not man. The Spirit of God moved moved and I want that to stay in your mind if I'm going to have victory over whatever I'm dealing with then the spirit of God it says when the spirit of God came upon David that he would run through a troop and he would leap over walls when the spirit of God comes upon you you won't spend your time Binding devils and loosing devils when the Spirit of God is upon you, then He will recognize that you are under divine anointing. The Spirit of God moved. We're now in the 21st century. What kind of world are we living in? We have politicians around the world that are bankrupt. I say around the world. They have used up every idea, every knowledge, every philosophy, every system they know, and it's not working anymore. In the bastion of democracy, and, 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 and it is said by the, and I've been to England many, many times, you would know that the young people of England have benefits that other people of the world are only dreaming about. Yet, for four days, there was a rampage in the bastion of democracy. In a country known for discipline and order, it happens. Switzerland, which has always been most stable, now we see the rise of a, of, of a, a fascist type movement. In Switzerland, that was the most liberal and open for people. We heard of the massacres in Norway. A country that where the king of Norway could walk down the street without guards. In one moment, it's changed. In our own country, there was a time when evening services on a Sunday started at 7.30. And we believe in church and walking home if you walked 10 o'clock in the night. Now you could hardly get people out. On a Sunday evening. Because the landscape has changed. Now all things around us are changing. They are indicators of the end times. And I can't get into the details of that. The time's clock is striking the hour. That iniquity is abounding. That, that the wickedness of man increases more and more. What does the church do in a time like this? We are still here. If we were not here, then we have no responsibility. But we are here. And if we are here, then the Bible says we are the light. Now you would notice in the scripture, when the Spirit of God moved, the first thing God said was, let there be light. Jesus said, you are the lights. I've heard preachers say, there's a cloud of darkness over this nation. I've heard preachers, prophets prophesy, there's a cloud of darkness over this nation. Well, I'm neither a prophet, apostle, or any one of those. I just want to let you know that the church, if there is a cloud of darkness, then the church is responsible to get rid of it because we are the light and for the light to shine we need fuel and that fuel is the Holy Spirit let there be light then Jesus said you're not only light you're salt so we are the enlightening element and we are the restraining element on planet Earth. Let me go to this here in Genesis. Uh, I think I have another hour and a half. 
So, did somebody groan? Listen, light not only reveals, light also exposes. And as the light shone, you, you could see the disorder. As the light shone, you could see what's happening around you. An old lady came to a service we were having a long time ago and I was conducting it at the Pentecostal Cathedral in Port of Spain. And she came because she was blind. So we prayed for her. And I didn't see her again because I was not the pastor. I just go in and assist at that time the pastor who was there. She came back maybe two, three weeks later and said God restored her sight. That was not so much the big issue. She said, I was blind. I'm a poor woman. I live in a shack. People will bring me food. Put it there on a table. I'll eat it when I'm hungry. She said, sometimes I go to the food and I could feel the ants and the cockroaches running across my hand. But I had to eat the food because that's what I had. Darkness causes people to do awful things. The crime is because of darkness. The ungodliness is because of darkness. There is a spiritual darkness that has gripped the hearts of men and women in this nation. And the only solution is for the Spirit of God to begin to hover. And listen, ladies and gentlemen, the Spirit of God is not in heaven. The Spirit of God is in the church. And the church is not this building. The church is every born again child of God. We are the repository of the gifts of the Spirit and the anointing of the Holy Ghost and the power of God. We are the custodians. I said it, I don't know if it was here or somewhere else recently. Pastor Gomes, to the, the, the problem we may have is that we've become reservoirs, containers, hoarders, A lot of stuff God has given to us. Our cup is full and running over. We're not called upon to be reservoirs just to collect. But Bishop, we're called upon to be conduits through which it flows. Not reservoirs, but conduits. It comes into us and it flows. Healing and deliverance and salvation and victory and deliverance for men and women. It flows out of us. Jesus said to the woman, out of your belly will flow rivers. Rivers. He said, let there be light. And very quickly, when the Spirit of God moved, this is what happened. First, the light shone to reveal, to expose. Secondly, God established order. Okay, waters back up. Let the dry land appear. Let's, let's put some order where there is disorder. Now, I could spend some time on the waters and on the dry land. But I won't spend too much time now except to say that in prophetic literature, waters refer to political systems. And the earth or the dry land refers to the religious system. And whenever there's a mix-up between the politics and the religion, then there is chaos. From the beginning, God said, Waters back away. Dry land appear. God establish order. The first act of God is the moving of the Spirit. The second act of God is to shine light. The third act of God is to establish order. And the fourth act of God is to bring forth fruits. 
Are you understanding? You cannot have fruit until the spirit moves. Until order is a, until light has shone and until order is established. Whose order? The order of Almighty God. The Spirit of God moved. At this convention, and as you plan for your future, as you look ahead, don't spend too much time looking back because you can't fix yesterday. Somebody said it recently and I've used it a few times. Have you noticed the difference between a review mirror and a windshield? The review mirror is where you look back. You look at it to look back. Have you noticed the difference in size? Between that and the windshield which gives you a panoramic vision of what is ahead. There is much more ahead than what has gone before. There was a revival a hundred years ago that spawned movements around the world. But there is much more ahead. Peter says there is an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled reserved in the heavens to be revealed in the last days. There is something that Paul didn't see. Something that Peter didn't see. Something that the church fathers did not see. Something that the revivalists of a hundred years ago did not see. But there is something we are going to see in our time. The moving of the Spirit of God. Now how will that happen? If, if we need for that to happen, we have to do like what Mary said. Let it be done. Let it be done. Lord is going to change around my plans, but let it be done. Lord, I'm going to have to put my marriage on hold, but let it be done. Lord, I'll have some questions to answer to a few people, but let it be done. Lord, when I tell people I'm pregnant by the Holy Ghost, nobody's going to believe me, but let it be done. Lord, when I tell people I'm carrying the Lord in my belly, they will think I'm crazy, but let it be done. Are you understanding me? Let it be done. So that 2,000 years later, some people even worship the girl. Because she allowed the Spirit to move. She allowed the Spirit to move. What do we need today? What do we need today? New religions? New church systems? What do we need today? More music. I love the music. I couldn't play a note. But I like it. One of my great desires when I get to heaven is to be able to sing. Down here I make a joyful noise. And God enjoys it. If nobody else does. When I'm leading a song, sometimes in the church my wife looks at me and she has a hundred wrinkles on her forehead. Because I don't follow the musicians. They follow me wherever I go. And I go places where they can't follow. They, they just wait until I get back on, on, on level ground. No, that's not what it is. The men that shook this world, the men and women, were ordinary men and women. Some had serious problems and difficulties. I read recently of Charles Spurgeon, known as the Prince of Preachers, a man used by God tremendously. I have stacks of his books in my office that I look at sometimes and amazed at his ability to expound the word. And yet every two years, Charles Spurgeon will go into a period of depression that would last for four months. Where he would stay in a dark room. He's not demon possessed. He's just human being. And human being deals with all kinds of issues. One of the things that amazes me is how God takes his Holy Spirit and put it in us. 
But Charles Spurgeon will come out of that depression, get behind the pulpit, and, and you would think he had spent the last four months in the throne room of God. Yes, the Holy Spirit doesn't mean there won't be battles, or there won't be storms, or there won't be difficulties. But when the Spirit moves, and we allow Him to move, then there's going to be order, there's going to be light, there's going to be order, and there's going to be fruitfulness. And I want to stay with those three. When the Spirit moves, there'll be light. Light means He'll show you. He'll reveal to you. He'll show you things you can't learn in a theological text. He'll show you things you couldn't find anywhere else but in His presence. He is going to open up your mind and open up your understanding. Secondly, as He moves and He shows the light, He's going to establish order. He's going to establish order. He's going to rearrange some things. I pray for the day. And I know it's going to come. When, when we come to church on Sunday morning. And we sing the first song. That something is just going to break open from heaven. And somebody else may preach beside me. And the worship leader may be on their face on the ground. And the power of God will take over. You see, this is the revival I was born into. This is where we came to church 9 o'clock in the morning. And it was not unusual to leave at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Children and adults and nobody died. Nobody fainted. Because when this, this is not something that will happen every day. But when it happens, you don't want to miss out on what God is doing. I remember one of those moves of God. Pastor, Pastor Gomes, a lady is kneeling down. God's really dealing with her. There's no big loud noise or whatever. But you could see she is being touched by God. And the pastor came by and I'm kneeling next to her. And she says, Pastor, would you please tell God to stop? I've had enough. I don't think I could, I could handle any more. And he says, sis, when God is doing it, you don't tell him to stop. You take as much as you can because the Spirit of God does not always strive with man. There is not always a big shower. Some days it's just a drizzle. And some days no drizzle at all. But we need to have a move of the Spirit. Let me in closing. I'm not saying this being critical of anybody. Because I travel to other places and preach. I may not be in their category. We bring some of the best names into the country. We put them up. At the hotels. We bring out tens of thousands of people to listen. Whether it's T.D. Jakes or Benny Hinn or Creflo Dollar and others who have come before and others who may come. And we expect people to come because they are advertised. When, when this one comes, the country will never be the same. So we expect somebody to come with a revival in their back pocket. It doesn't work that way. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, says God, then I will hear from heaven i will hear from heaven we have expectation in the wrong place so we look to america we look to africa we look to india somebody said but you know this preacher in india he has a church of fifty thousand people why don't you invite him to come Trinidad needs him. No, Trinidad needs a move of the Holy Spirit in the church across this nation. That's what we need. That's what's going to make a difference. That's what's going to break the chains. For the prophet says it is the anointing 
that breaks the chains and shatters the fetters and bring liberty. As I bring this to a close tonight, I want to ask you, how hungry are you for a move of God? How hungry are you for a move of God? A young preacher came to me about three, four years ago. He said, I need to talk to you. He's in ministry maybe about five, six years. He sat down in my office and he said, I want to be just like you. I said, oh, go ahead, tell me what, what you want to be. He says, well, I want a church like this. Uh, I want a car like yours. I want to travel all about, you know. And God has opened some doors for me to travel and preach the gospel, teach. He says, I want, I, I want those things. I said, well, I don't think you could be like me because God only makes, don't make duplicates. But, but let me tell you how it's done. Then I told him, I says, you don't need a congregation like mine. You don't need a car like mine. You don't need a house like mine. You don't need uh, 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 the ability to travel all over. I said, what you need is a moving of the Holy Spirit in your life. And I says, when the Spirit of God takes a hold of you, you won't have to ask for anything. He will open the doors. He will guide you. He's going to prosper you. He's going to protect you. He's going to lead your life so that you won't have to be looking at somebody else and say, I want to be like them. One more thing I want to say before I close. I was so totally upset. And I don't get upset so easy. I was in the bank this morning doing a transaction. And while their, their television was on just next to the line where the tellers were. And there's this man talking to people about being able to help them. And, and, and I'm here dealing with the facts as they are. And, and, and he has a glass of water. And he says, I will bless this water, so I want each of you to go and get a glass of water in your house. And after I bless it, you will drink it. And it will bring blessings and healing. Listen, that is, in one word, hogwash. I looked at another one. Bishop, he has a, a big container of olive oil. Send a name or picture of your loved one. And when we drop it in that olive oil, that anointing of the Holy Ghost, they will immediately be saved. Garbage. Another one has a red rose. If you come to church and get one of these red rose, it represents the rose of Sharon. Put it on your pillow and your husband will never wonder. When the spirit is not moving, we have to come up with all these gimmicks and plans. God don't need that kind of help. When the, we Read through the, the New Testament and see what they did. They went everywhere preaching the word. The Lord confirming his word with signs following. The sick are healed. Devils are cast out. Nobody goes and gets a big container of olive oil and say dip in it. I'm saying this because we are substituting. And somebody has got to stand up and say, no, 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 no. A relative of my wife and I sells bottles of olive oil that came from Israel and blessed by Benny Hinn. I'm not anti Benny and I'm just saying what is being done. You buy one and put a little on every day. And that represents the Holy Ghost. Listen. Let me say this. Nowhere in the New Testament is are we to use oil as an indication of the anointing. Nowhere. 
in the New Testament, oil is only used for the praying for the sick. And, and in fact, in a real uh, research into that statement where it says, if any is sick, let them call for the elders of the church, let them anoint them with oil, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Let me explain a little bit what that means. And, 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 and it, it, it totally is different to what we do today. What it means, when people were sick then, they would rub ointments on themselves and be clothed in particular garments and stay in their house. When they were healed, they would then wash that off and anoint themselves with oil. This would be olive oil that was infused with fragrance. An indication that I am well. Because the other anointing oil didn't smell very good. It had myrrh and frankincense. But this anointing oil had spikenard. I brought some spikenard for my wife from Israel and she is saving it for heaven. It's still sitting there and she looks at it and I went and looked at it today and the bottle is still as full. And you understand the difference? I'm just saying that we're getting carried away. And one final thing. This is really final. I usually say final five times, but this is final. If the oil represented the Holy Spirit, okay, in the Old Testament, and if the Holy Spirit is now with us, hear me now, Holy Spirit is with us. And the oil was symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me give you a little example. Before my wife and I were married, she had a picture of me. You did, right? Yes. Now, I'm not going to tell you what I had. I'm just telling you what she had. She had a picture of me. And so, when she went to bed... She would have that picture right by her. Right? Right? We weren't married as yet, you know, a long time ago. She'd have that picture there. Look at the picture. Admire the picture. You know, I had no beard. I had much more hair on my head. I was, I was uh, 41 years younger. You know. After we got married, she don't need the picture anymore. Are you understanding? The picture is only symbolic of someone. When that person comes, the picture goes. I'll give you one more example. I have a, and, and these folks will know who I'm talking about, a lady in my congregation, lovely lady. Her husband died maybe six years ago. She, she would be, be, maybe be in her 40s. And she'd marry this guy who was an old preacher, maybe 40 years older than her. Maybe. So obviously he was going to die before her. Um, you know, I mean, under, under normal things, I mean, young people do die, but he's dead and gone. He is gone. And because he is gone and she needs him, she recently was not too well. We went to visit her and she had his picture frame and all on the bed. Follow me. I'm coming to a point. She has his shirt and tie hung up near the bed. And around her neck, she has his old sweater. Now, now mind you, he is gone, so she has symbols of him. Follow me well. He is not there, but she knows that without him she is empty. So she is trying to fill the gap with those symbols. Now I bring this home. If the Holy Ghost is not 
moving. But we know without the Holy Ghost, we are empty, we are blind, we are drifting, we are barren. Until we have the Holy Ghost, what we're settling for are symbols. Get rid of the symbols and get back to a move of the Holy Ghost. Stand with me, please. Stand with me, please. Look at me, please, ladies and gentlemen. Look at me. You're a part of the people that God has raised up in Trinidad and Tobago for this moment. And as far as where God may take you, but you are part of that people. Regardless of the denominational tags and so, that's not the issue. You're part of God's people. You're part of God's people. There's need for a moving of the Holy Spirit. We've been settling for symbolic things and patterns when what we need is the real, the Holy Spirit to move. There's some things that are out of order that needs to be put in order. There's some darkness that needs to be dispelled. There's some barrenness that needs to be changed into fruitfulness. And what's going to start this process is when again we have the Spirit of God hovering over. When he hovers over, he's saying, I'm in control. I'm here to do something. And as the Word of God, because as God spoke the Spirit, as God spoke the Spirit, the energy of the Spirit ignited the Word of God and creation was unfolding. As God speaks, that Holy Spirit that's hovering over us is going to begin to perform the work that we need to see done. I'm going to pray just now. I want to make one request of you. If you say, either I need to get real hungry or I am hungry. But I need to become desperately hungry. Because only he that hungers and thirsts shall be filled. So I can experience that move of God. For two moments before I hand back this microphone. W want us to pray together. Would you please come meet me at the front here. Let me pray with you. Would you come now, please? Thank you. Come. Just stand here. God said in the last days, I'll pour out on the young men, on the young women. I'll pour out. I'll pour out. What we need is his move, not our move. What we need is for his spirit to move. And when his spirit moves, things are going to fall into place. This Trina Pentecostal Church of God was born in the fires of the Holy Ghost. If you read the history of it, it was born in the fires of the Holy Ghost. Sparks flew. And wherever those sparks landed, a movement was raised up. A movement that continued for, for, cent for scores of years, for decades, until today. I've been reading again the, the history of the move of God across the U.S. and across Britain and across the world. And a hundred years ago, some people got hungry. They got desperate. They said, Lord, average won't do. They said, Lord, this, this church is, is, uh, that we have is not sufficient. It's good. They're nice people. But we need something supernatural to dominate, to be in control. And God heard from heaven. And God visited. And a revival broke out. We are the results of that move of God. And our generation is now counting on us. Our nation is counting on us. The 1.3 million people of which there may be, there may be 200,000 born again Christians. 1.1 million people in this nation are saying, we need help. Whether it's the bandit or the murderer or the kidnapper or the businessman or the mother working her fingers to the bone, people need help. And that help comes when the Spirit of God moves and it moves upon us. And like David, we could run through troops. We could leap over walls. 
Lift your hand to the Lord with me. Father, you brought this fellowship of believers here tonight. You have given me a word that I've shared with them. And Lord, just as in the beginning when there was darkness and void and chaos and disorder and barrenness, your spirit moved and you spoke. You spoke a world into existence. Lord God, in our time, there is darkness. Lord God, there is an instability. Lord, there's a nation that needs to experience a move of God. We have seen the move of Satan. We have seen the criminal elements. We have seen the anguish of men and women. We have seen the anger of some people. We have seen the instability. And we're saying, oh God, it's going to take more than politics. It's going to take more than negotiations. It's going to take more than protective services. It's going to take more than a new economic order. It's going to take a move of the Holy Ghost. And Lord, that move has got to start in me. Start in us. Touch your people tonight. Touch your people tonight. And let us be a beginning of, of a revival. Now can you look at me for a moment? Revivals are used, the word revival is used to describe all kinds of things. Maybe a week of meetings or whatever. What is a revival? When God said, I will revive what has been lost. What is a revival? In simple terms, a revival is to restore to original condition in order to facilitate original function. And for the church to restore to original condition so we could do what is the function of the church to change the world to bring the governance of God on men and women that's what a revival is a revival is not just to shake you but a revival is when you are shaken, you shake your home, you shake your community, you shake your workplace. A revival is not only to stir you, but when you walk into wherever you are, out of you will be flowing something that cannot be resisted. So like Peter and John walking in to the city, somebody ran ahead and said, The men that have turned the world upside down are coming. That's what they're coming. While the man was on the television today and there are two ladies, one in front of me, one behind me, and I couldn't escape their conversation. Oh, they just want people money. They're going to use gimmicks to get people money. That's what happens when you use gimmicks. But when there's a real move of God, you don't have to convince anybody. I say you don't have to convince anybody. Let me tell you what the world is looking for and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Thomas met the disciples. They said to Thomas, we've seen Jesus. Thomas says, you have seen him, you have touched him, but I haven't. Except I see and I touch. In other words, what Thomas is saying, I need evidence. I need evidence. Call him doubting Thomas if you want, but he need evidence. And what our society need is not just another church. They need evidence. That's what they need. Evidence. And when Thomas got evidence, he fell on his knees and said, My Lord and my God. And before Jesus could get back to heaven, he's on a ship taking him to the south coast of India to plant churches. And even into inland China where he planted churches. Why? Because he got evidence. And that's what we need to see today. I want to pray one more time. Father, lay your hand upon your people. And I pray tonight, O oh God, you will, you will light a fire. A fire that no devil in hell or no man on earth will be able to put out. I pray tonight, O oh God, you will kindle a flame that will burn deeper and deeper and deeper until, oh God, there is an experience 
explosion of Holy Ghost power in the life of every believer and by extension every congregation that this nation of Trinidad and Tobago will know that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Amen.